before we get started again, I have a couple of quick announcements. First of all, if you have lost a cell phone or a flash drive, check at the registration desk where they're waiting for you. Also, so that we don't uh, lose any of the time, we're going to go until 5.30 this evening, so our last panel has its full hour and a half. Our next and final panel takes the life and death of objects as its subject. Our panelists include Eva Lane Bois, Professor of Art History at the Institute for Advanced Study, David Bomford, Associate Director for Collections at the J. Paul Getty Museum, Jim Coddington, Agnes Gunn, Chief Conservator at the Museum of Modern Art, Christine Maring, Associate Professor of Art History at the University of Chicago, Jill Sterrett, Director of Collections and Conservation at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and Jeffrey Weiss, Director of the Dia Art Foundation and also the Chair of this panel. Welcome. Um, thank you all. Uh, thank you, Rebecca, and thanks to the Getty. Um, I add my gratitude to the um, uh, expressions of, of uh, thanks that we've heard already. It's been, I think, a very interesting conference and the kind of thing we all should be doing. Uh, Getty uh, should be doing it, and so should we, and I'd like to see more of it myself. Um, and one of the things I think I'd like to um, derive from it in the future is, um, is a, a forum where we can ask each other hard questions and be willing to jump in and, and speculate on those questions about whether or not we should, for example, show works uh, uh, certain kinds of works, works that fall into certain categories of, of uh, remake, uh, of categories of treatment or, or of refabrication and, 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 and so forth. And I want to start um, with, to, by going back to Eva Hess, but I just wanted bef before that to make a few preliminary remarks of my own. Um, first, the, I know I have a panel here of people who have a lot of strong opinions and a lot to say, so that's going to be um, uh, a great uh, opportunity for, I think, all of us to re-engage some of these issues. Um, some of the panelists haven't spoken yet, um, and uh, I think that's also, um, that's also a good thing. Um, so we'll start with the panel um, eventually and then open it up to you. That's the intention. Um, we'll do Eva Hess before that, but first, as I said, I wanted to make um, a few uh, fra remarks and by way of framing this session uh, to say that I think we think of ourselves to a certain degree as respondents to the, to the session, um, the name of our session, uh, respondents to the conference, the name of our session, The Life and Death of Objects, is um, sort of lends itself to the entire proceedings, I think, in a really useful way. Um, and um, I can't emphasize enough how much um, the, my relationship as a former curator to, um, and semi-academic to uh, curator uh, to conservators has uh, um, influenced and shaped uh, the way I do uh, the work that I do, the historical work that I do, as well as my curatorial practice. Um, so I do think that what we're talking about here in the context of this conference is a, um, is a consideration of various models of the way that we relate to each other uh, as professionals in different but related fields. Uh, and something that I'd love to see eventually over time, and I think it's beginning to happen and I, I think you saw this with, um, to a degree with Ann Wagner and also um, with Yvonne Lain, uh, among others, um, is a um, coming together of these issues in, um, that in, a, in a form that somewhat transcends the categories of conservation versus curatorial work versus academic scholarship, um, that we, sh we sh could perhaps over time come to a point where we're not thinking of these things um, in, in separate ways. Um, and, but in fact, trying instead to establish a kind of um, hybrid. Uh, and I want to echo what Yvonne Lance said before, in, even in my time, uh, conversations like this, conferences like this are, are increasingly, um, the level of, of sophistication, the level of um, complexity in which we're willing to address these issues and to engage these issues in both privately and in public in conferences and in, in the literature has grown hugely over the past decade or so. And, um, that seems to me to be um, a great thing. So, um, but what, I, what I'm finding um, as I go to events like this and, or attend them and, and read about them is that the questions do tend to be um, always to, to um, uh, come back to, to issues relating to case studies, uh, to specific problems for spe specific examples as we have seen. And obviously everything has to start with the case study. 
Um, so that's not inherently a bad thing. It does, however, because a case study is easier to talk about than larger precepts and principles and uh, the, the never mind the question of a philosophy of what we do uh, in this regard or an ethics um, or I think even a poetics of what it is we're up to in this, um, this exchange, in this conversation. Those questions tend to slip away and it could be possible, as speaking to my colleague Lynn earlier about this, could be possible, it might be impossible to accomplish something like that in a in, a, in such a large group, but I, I, you know, I'd like to think that that um, that it's that it's worth trying. Uh, and since so many informed people and so many engaged people are here today, ultimately, what I'd like to do with this panel is to push us somewhat in the direction of some of the larger questions. Um, so that's my ambition. It will go the way it goes based on what it is everyone says, of course, and we'll see. Uh, but it's also true, I think, of the audience as well as the panel, and I'd be asking you all to jump in uh, as, uh, a little bit later um, on some of these bigger questions. Questions, I think, in part of, uh, again, a philosophy. Uh, also questions of interpretation, to the degree to which um, the choices we're making in relation to, and this is something that came up yesterday in a question by um, Joyce Tsai, who's here, I think still here, um, who's a graduate student working on Maholi Nag, <coughs> uh, the degree to which what we're doing uh, when we do this, we talk about these um, examples and we have these exchanges, the degree to which it's a f it itself is a form of interpretation. It's an interpretive act. Um, and it's, I think, important for us to remember that, uh, and we always do, but we, you know, it gets lost as we get, as we, as we um, get caught up in these ex con very concrete exchanges. It's important for us to remember that the choices we're making, at least to step back, and see that the choices we're making belong to history as much as the objects do, that we ourselves are part of a historical uh, process in which this collaboration of fields <coughs> is unfolding. Um, that's, I think, a huge topic for the field and, um, and a thrilling one, potentially. Um, and in, in many ways, I think it's, um, uh, it's incumbent on us not only to address the practical questions, the practical matters, but also to uh, take advantage of the, of the of these questions and these problems to, if, uh, and extrapolate from them a uh, larger, perhaps, a, a larger set of ideas, uh, but also to behave or to, to, to speak in a self-conscious way, deliberately, in a self-critical way, to recognize that the choices we're making um, don't exist, uh, or aren't necessarily right or wrong per se, uh, and not always just better than the choices that were made a generation ago in relation to some of these issues of conservation treatment and the like. Um, that they themselves, the ones that we are, the choices we're making now, as opposed to 20 or 30 years ago, also belong to a particular period in time in which the art that we're addressing is, um, is being uh, examined uh, and, uh, and engaged uh, in, an, in, an, in a fashion that reflects who we are as professionals and uh, who we are as historians and the perspective that we have on a particular body of work in a particular period of time. Um, and that 20 or 30 years from now will be looked back upon, or 40 or 50 if we're not around by then, um, as having been just that. Um, and, um, and it's not the worst thing in the world to, to, um, to pause and I think and take that into consideration. Um, to which end, I'd like to go back to Eva Hess, and I'm not sure how to turn this on. Can you? Thanks. Um, because I got, I got the feeling um, from the fascinating session before, uh, earlier today, before lunch, that, um, uh, that some of the hard questions that were being asked by the panel uh, of all of us in the room were um, being avoided. And um, those questions having to do with what it is we're looking at now versus what the object once was and where that leaves us with respect to showing it, studying it, you know, addressing it, engaging it in some way, um, and whether or not we should um, put it into, into the world anymore or uh, instead put it away and um, treat it as not even an artifact anymore but a relic. Um, and one consideration just to start things, and I'll ask this of the panel, and if there are opinions on the panel about that that weren't expressed before, I'd love to hear them. From my point of view, um, one of the considerations that I think didn't come up is the question of light in Hess's work, which I think is very important and um, given 
uh, her late works on paper, um, uh, which some of which resemble Rothko, uh, is an element that I think um, should be taken into consideration. And it seems to me that um, that the work and the state that it's in now uh, does not respond to or live in in the world of light in the way anything like the way that it did once before. And from from that point of view, I think we're looking at a an object that is um, uh, that is probably past legitimate um, installation in the, in the sense that we would show it without explanation and just address it and treat it as a work by Eva Hess, um, among other things that are true of the work in its deteriorated state. Um, but I also feel that what happened, and so that's a, that's a kind of an opinion, I put it out there for what it's worth, um, I feel that what happened when we were talking before is that the, 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 um, the responses to what the panel was saying, in addition to being too cautious, um, had started to um, address the age of the work, which I'm addressing as a serious problem, in a way that we've seen before um, in, uh, in the literature on Eva Hess, um, which was quasi-biographical, which is to say that the, that the um, deteriorated state, the compromised state of the work, the owing to age, among other things, uh, reflects uh, something that is not necessarily uh, not necessarily compromising after all, but in fact uh, is um, uh, is relevant to Hess's um, tragic death and uh, to the um, the way in which uh, that early death has informed so much of the literature uh, uh, and so much of the. Uh, literature on Hess and the way the uh, like scholars for a long time um, found themselves addressing, inevitably addressing the work. Um, and there's been correction in the in the field of many corrections of many kinds along those lines. But um, but it, I've never been to an event relating to Eva Hess when this didn't start to happen. When people spoke of the sadness of it on the one hand and of the poetry of the sadness of it on the other. Um, and uh, I'd be very curious to know what. Um, some of the has specialists in the audience or others feel about, um, about that subject in relation to this question, which is to say that I'm asking that this concrete example actually be um, used as a vehicle for um, discussing uh, or having an exchange or discussing these issues perhaps in somewhat um, less, um, uh, less uh, clinical, in, some, in a somewhat less clinical fashion. So before going back to larger issues and the, and the question of summing up to, to the degree that we can, um, I'd like to turn this question over to uh, my fellow panelists to see if there's anything that we can say to continue the Hess conversation, uh, which I, I do think was somewhat cut short earlier today. And I wouldn't identify anybody else, just ask anybody at all to jump in. You know, Jeffrey, I'd like to just jump in by asking you a question. Can I ask the moderator a question? Um, because I think there was a, there, um, when, when, when we, when our panelists responded to, a mo to the moments that actually sort of pushed their opinions in, in one direction or another, um, had I been asked that question, I would have pointed to the Jewish Museum show. Um, I think it was an extraordinary, um, an extraordinary exhibition, and I think especially on the heels of the 2002 retrospective, it allowed us to look not only at uh, the late works, but it allowed us to look at works that, in fact, had not been made available mm. for the 2002 retrospective. So you know where I'm going with yeah. this. <laughs> and I wanted to sort of go back and ask you about what happened between 2002 and 2006 and to influence the National Gallery's decision um, to put test piece on display. Sure. Um, <laughs> it's not a, as dicey a question as it may sound. Um, well, I, before being the director of DI, I was curator of modern contemporary art at the National Gallery. And um, Jill is speaking of a piece that's called Test Piece for Contingent by Eva Hess that we own, the gallery that they have, and um, that we, they were showing routine, you know, um, uh, off and on because it, we had learned, I'm just going to say we for now. Um, that it was um, um, res that it was responding to light, uh, among other things, and um, that it needed to be um, that the that the changes that were influenced by light could be partly corrected by keeping the work in the dark. Um, 
And, but there's also, there was also the question of traveling, above all, I think, and, and with respect to exhibitions, of traveling the piece and the fragility of the piece um, on the one hand, and also on the uh, verses on the other, or with, along with, on the other, the, um, the, the presumed uh, near-perfect <coughs> condition of the piece. This was a piece that was kept largely in storage for many years and shown very little before it entered the museum collection. Um, and for that reason, it kind of occupies this, the other end of this, the Hess spectrum um, that we've been discussing today. It's in extremely good condition. condition. It's made of, of latex and, um, uh, and uh, where's Jay? Latex and cheesecloth and, yeah, cheese, cheesecloth and latex. Um, and um, so it, it has, um, it, the materials are c common in, in Hess's late work, uh, but the state of preservation was highly uncommon. So not traveling the piece and showing it very little had partly to do with preserving a work. And this is a, this is a question that did come up in the earlier Eva Hess panel mm -hmm. that it was reproduced in the exhibition catalog. Had to do with preserving a work in, that was actually in very good condition as opposed to protecting a work that was in, in bad condition. Um, what we learned was that, um, well, we, we devised new, um, I'm actually going to turn this over briefly to Jay, if he would stand up and, um, can we bring a microphone down here? This could happen earlier than we normally plan. Uh, Jay Kruger is here and he's a cons uh, um, one of the um, conservators um, at the National Gallery of Conservative for 20th Century Art there, or Modern and Contemporary Art, and was my partner in this whole process and in the, um, in, in, the, in the decision. I can add, before we get to Jay, I mean, skip ahead and s also say that the fact that the Jewish Museum show was um, dedicated to late, to very late work also influenced me to lend, in addition to the, f to the fact that New York had had no Eva Hess show um, when the Whitney um, had to abandon the retro showing the retrospective um, that, that was in San Francisco. So the opportunity to place the work into a specific context was a key consideration in my curatorial choice. But if Jay could just weigh in here, that'd be, be great. Just, just very shortly, it was, um, let's see, in, in 2002, it was the best preserved latex piece out there. I think we all pretty much agree on that. That's a fluke in that it's so thinly applied in the cheesecloth. It was the amount of material, I, I'm convinced. But between 2002 and, and the Jewish Museum exhibition, the latex deteriorated very rapidly. So where it, before it was exceptionally sticky and we just couldn't figure out a way to get it anywhere without it sticking to itself and causing damage. Mm. In those four years, it had oxidized enough. Now it was no longer sticky. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, it's moving towards the rigid phase. Mm. See, because, so it's, you know, Jay, the thing that I was, I, I must admit, I was kind of hoping to hear is that it didn't actually have to do with just the physical characteristics uh, the that you're describing. That actually there was available. a change in, th in, you know what I mean? Oh, that yeah. there was something that... A philosophical change, yeah, you yeah, mean, in the way? Exactly. Well, th this is something <laughs> we've always... <laughs> we, <laughs> yeah, we, yeah. We, we, we well, no, no. <laughs> had this discussion a lot that we want to show it, you know, since you may have a limited time in, you know, the next 50 years, 20 years, whatever it is, we should show it more regularly. Well, that, that was discussed a lot. Can I jump in this thing because yeah. it's the, to generalize a little bit the issue, which, which I think Eva has posed a perfectly great example. And, but if I understand well, I might not, but if I understand well, the material itself is going to deteriorate no matter what. Yes. So wouldn't it be better to show it at, yes. the, at the expense of accelerating its death? But since it's going to die anyway, at yeah. least one generation would show it'll, it'll see the work. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Instead of being instead of being in the dark box that nobody can see. Right. Yes. No, I mean, and but that choice has been you see, while I was there. Um, in, in fairness to me, I, I do believe the San Francisco show predates my um, just predates my tenure as head of the department. So the decision wasn't solely mine at the time not to lend to San Francisco, which we did not do. Um, uh, since that time, that's that's precisely the, the decision I made, and I did think of it as a as a philosophical question as well as a practical one and felt strongly, we now, we now, you, they, show it, um, uh, or, uh, and, or if they continue, you know, the, um, the, the um, Well, since we left, we don't do that. Anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's being, I showed it much more often than my predecessors for, for that reason. The, the fact is, as, as Jay would, will tell you, and as others will tell you, the piece is going to, going to change anyway. 
Um, so in actual fact, getting, you know, giving the, the work as much airtime as possible becomes, uh, rises to the top, you know, as, as a consideration. It seems to me that the, the, <coughs> the formulation of the question might be, what are we saving and who are we saving it for? Except, again, it's, the piece is not truly savable. Um, but the question of transporting the piece had to do with the, the, the change in the nature of the, the, the surface of the, the tackiness of the surface mm -hmm. uh, and the ability to safely transport, transport it and reinstall it um, several times in a row. Uh, are there any thoughts on the panel or out in the room on, on the question of, um, of expanded expansion and its fate? Yeah. Okay. Over here, Jack. <laughs> Um, uh, I, I'd like to take at, at least partial exception or, or ask for a, a little more um, detail from you on you, you were commenting that we are uh, sort of locked in our moment of time too and we should recognize that. I, I do agree with it but um, I also don't think that um, uh, you know, anything we do in particular restoration is just sort of hopelessly hostage to a relativism that uh, there is more information as time goes by. Some of that information is better information and certainly uh, there is, I think, um, uh, uh, better interpretations. Doesn't mean that there ultimately becomes, you know, the ultimate interpretation, but that, you know, time does improve our understanding and can ultimately lead to um, uh, perhaps uh, a better decision. I think a little closer to the mic. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, you didn't miss anything. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I would agree. I'm not calling for relativism at all, but um, only for, um, for self-awareness. I think there's a difference. Well, I think we should call for relativism, but not in the same way. Mm. Um, I was uh, thinking about your initial, initial uh, you know, uh, intro of the, the session was about trying to find a rule, and rule kind of not rule, but some kind of general, uh, general philosophy. Or general in, in some ways, I don't think it's possible. And that's why case studies have become so important in that field. It's because every work of art, not only every artist, but every work of art requires actually a, a kind of different ad hoc solution. Uh, that was particularly clear to in, in another um, uh, of this kind of discussion, which, to which, which has been alluded to uh, previously by someone uh, that had, had the state, the, 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 the this, this uh, symposium about uh, replication of works of art that, you know, especially sculpture, because it's a very different case completely different topic, basically, because you don't speak about painting and, and uh, sculpture, um, maybe for very different reasons, but <laughs> it was clear that pe people were speaking about, sp um, you know, uh, various case studies. It started all by the issue of Gabo, but it expanded to many others, and it was very clear that the, the kinds of problems raised by each work of art was ex extremely different each time. So the ethical questions, the aesthetic questions, change all the time. So I don't think that you can really have a very, very, I mean, that's why the whole purpose of the Tate thing is to try to find some kind of common denominator ground so that museums can eventually do du duplicates without it going into the market. I mean, all kinds of issues were at stake. But in fact, the, the practical questions raised by each work of art, each problem were each time so different than to try to find really some kind of common ground. You could, but it would be so general that it would be useless. That's, that was basically, I think, um, unless I'm completely fantasizing, but I think that was kind of the conclusion mm -hmm. of all the participants of this. Uh, and there are many of them in the room, so if I'm completely wrong, they can contradict me. But uh, I think that was the idea. Uh. Well, and to add to that, actually, I think that <coughs> the kind of specificity of the case study actually also, or the problems that a specific case study raises will actually change even with that specific case over time. I, thinking especially of the <coughs> exhibition copy that was made of expanding, well, the portion of expanding expansion and the problems of this, the status of that now. Um, and the fact that I think that that, um, that kind of fraction of the portion of this exhibition copy piece will gain in importance as time goes by actually. Um, and there might be a time when we might want to exhibit that. I want to just, because uh, I'm looking right at Barry, and I just want to make sure that everybody knows the estate has actually sort of agreed to this mock-up with very, very specific constraints about its its future. So it will it will not be circulating in the world. So no, I mean, <coughs> but would it ever be shown 
um, say, in a kind of separate gallery with appropriate explanation or anything like that? We didn't or have any of this data, thank you. Well, we did, the, the the Tate, I'm not uh, saying as a work, the, obviously. The, the Tate uh, uh, symposium, the, the replication symposium, started with Gabo because the Gabo family gave to the Tate a, a whole. No, uh, oh, sorry. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry. The the, the, the the Tate thing started because the Gabo family gave to the Tate, the Tate gave to the Tate um, a whole bunch of plexiglass works that date from I think from the mid from the 30s to much later, and they were works which were completely stable for quite a while, and then suddenly one, by the, one after the other began to you know, deteriorate. But then when they started to deteriorate, they started to deteriorate very fast. And the idea was that since a lot of those works were models for things that were to be made but were never made, or, the idea was from the family, and they asked, you know, what should we do to the, to the and they, they came to an agreement with, with the museum, as far as I understand, that they would try to make, um, try to find a way to document the, what the works were, because of course a photograph of a sculpture never conveys the, the spatial relationship. And so that's all started, what do we do? Do we do a replica, do we do it? And if we do, what is it considered? My, uh, my position with that is yes, you make a, do, uh, a replica and you, and you consider it as a document, like as a three-dimensional three photograph, you know, and you explain. You said the, the 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 original completely became dust. Well, that's a photograph of the like a three D. That was my position about it. But I'm not sure that everyone agrees. But anyway, I think that's a pos that's a possibility with regard to that. So, in a way, this mock-up of S could be said to be a kind of three-dimensional photograph exactly. for a while, you know, and it will age as well. So it will be a tri uh, it will be also a movie, the aging <laughs> <laughs> photograph plus <laughs> plus time. Um, but as long as it's uh, I'm not saying that, that, that I'm pretty, I'm not saying that it's every, so every time it's the sort Microphone, of the microphone. Yeah, I, I'm not saying that it's, uh, it's, once again, it's not a rule for every time. I'm not even sure, I'm not, you're not considered yet if it was, it's appropriate for Esther to, to think that way, but, but that's a possibility. If you absolutely, if you absolutely clearly explain to the, the people who are going to look at this work that it is not an original work, but it's a document, and you say, you know, uh, there's, I don't think there's, there's, uh, I mean, there's, for, for a lot of purposes, to see, a, to see an object in three dimension when it was made in three dimension is a lot, leave us uh, some information that you wouldn't digest for by a photograph. So, so what do you think, Jim, about that? I'm still processing. <laughs> 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 On the subject of Hess, Dan, uh, we need a mic. Thanks. Well, I, I don't want to um, say very much uh, about these issues because there's so much else to talk about. Um, but I do want to raise just one or two questions actually, Jeffrey, about the kinds of standards we might use to make the decisions that are before us. Um, and um, I want to offer your um, reasoning up as um, a negative example. And your reasoning said that because light is crucial to Hess's late work, that expanded expansion um, shouldn't be exhibited. But um, I could then take the microphone and say um, recombination and um, indeterminacy are crucial to Hess's late work. And um, Untitled Rope Piece is a demonstration of that. So um, my argument trumps yours. But I could also say, ah, following your argument, Schema has lost its luminous quality, and so therefore we're not going to exhibit schema anymore. And then my argument would negatively trump your argument. And I think that that, that sort of argumentation is, is problematic, um, and be, because it assumes a, a possible um, universal and uh, accurate standard of interpretation of an artist's work, which I don't think that we've arrived at. And rather, I think that we would um, want to exhibit 
expanded expansion um, because it adds so much, it does add so much to our knowledge of her work. I think we could debate the kind of exhibition in which it would be appropriate, very appropriate in a retrospective of Hess's work. Maybe less appropriate in an exhibition in, entitled, as in 1986, um, Transformations in Sculpture. Probably, in, unless that was about how sculpture transforms itself. Probably not, in other words, <laughs> taking a place in a narrative of what happens in the 1960s or some such narrative because the explanatory burden on the show would be distorted by its presence there. Um, I, I could go on by modeling possible context in which the knowledge would be, you know, would be so valuable and so rich to show it. Um, if anyone wants to ask me to do a show in which expanded expansion is included, please, you know, I'd love, I'd love to do it. But um, those would be my thoughts. Yes. Just to add a, a, a another artist to the mix, but I think a relevant one. What sense do you then make of, or what validity do you give to museums paying good money for Arturo Schwartz's reproductions of Marshall Duchamp's ready-mades? <coughs> oh, I would argue it's a completely different case conceptually. Um, those um, reproductions have had a role, to, were certainly authorized, and um, they um, are uh, works that belong actually to the to the oeuvre of Marcel Duchamp, uh, and they fall into a very complex conceptual category of replication and reproduction that's true to the early philosophical questions that um, that um, the Duchamp had been asking in his in his work um, since the um, since the teens, um, and that in turn, as a body of work, the, the replications of the ready mades um, had a, uh, a big impact on, um, on younger artists uh, in the 1960s and 1970s um, as replications, uh, precisely their status as replications, reproductions, and facsimiles and the like, um, took on a life of its own, giving Duchamp himself a sort of second life uh, in, the, um, in the history of, um, of post-war art, uh, especially in the United States. So I would distinguish between those two things. I, and I want to add that I wasn't making an absolute um, the, don't destroy expanded expansion. My question has to do with in what context is such a work permissibly shown without accountability uh, of any kind. And I would argue uh, just briefly that, that while contingency, of course, is it clearly is an essential part of, of Hess's work, um, the jury is still out to what degree contingency is um, it what, how, how to quantify good contingency versus, versus bad contingency. Um, so, and in the case of Hess, we're dealing with a body of work in which these elements, such as light and the materiality of the work, certain kind of materiality, are, are almost all there, there is to contend with. Um, and so the elements, I think, take on a much larger, pro occupy a much larger proportion of the, of the um, as criteria for um, for standards by which we make these, these choices. Um, and I would say the same, and it was something I wanted to get into a little bit later, um, about other work from that generation that we consider or call process work, uh, a name that, leaving aside the names, uh, the type, the, the epithet, the, the, um, um, the relevance or irrelevance of, the, of that word as a, as a useful word, and Eva Hess was one of the people who seem to hate that word in relation to her work. But there is, nonetheless, a body of work that is, uh, that's mostly, um, um, uh, that's, that's first and foremost, or first and last, material um, in, the, in, the, in as, as raw a state or as, as pure a form as, you, as, as, as the history of art has ever encountered. And in, in, in that the, therefore, the choices we make with respect to that body, that kind of work, and Eva Hess belongs to that group, are stand apart from the choices we make on behalf of other artists, which is, yes, to make a relative, a case for relativism, uh, I suppose, but just in response to, to Anne. Maybe, maybe to add to, can we, just to add to this briefly, um, to tease that out a little bit more, um, I think it's important to think about the different roles or functions or reasons why we might make exhibition copies or replicas, you know, with or without an artist's involvement. Um, and, you know, one reason being 
we are losing a work or we may only have an artifact left. Um, so that's a different status than, say, making um, an, a work where it's, with, especially with an artist's involvement, where it's built into the conception of the work, as you were just stressing, as I think is also the case with the uh, Room 19, as Lynn was talking about briefly, I believe, yesterday. Um, but then there are also other reasons, such as, you know, it happens a lot that we remake works or an artist ma remakes a work because you want to protect the original, which plays in with Hess also, such mm. as the Morris Felt pieces. I know that there are several remakes that have been done. But then there are also the remakes, exhibition copies that get made sort of, sometimes it seems to me out of matters of convenience because you don't want to go through the trouble of getting the loan or you can't get the loan, um, which happens quite a bit with photographs actually. Um, and there I think we're getting into a more tricky territory, but I, I just wanted to sort of systematize that a little bit and get the nuances out there. Um, if, if I could just respond to Anne's comment, because um, you know, it, uh, on the one hand, I, I think it's an incredibly optimistic um, approach to restoration um, that you know, one can keep uh, interpreting and trying to find um, uh, the meanings, um, uh, new, not necessarily new meanings, but uh, emphasize meanings that were there before in uh, a work of art or a, an artist of, and um, uh, uh, find value for uh, displaying it and uh, keeping it alive, at least in the collective consciousness. But I do wonder whether there is a point at which something that is, um, you know, th there may be lots of these values still retained in the work, but wh whether at some point works lose something that is so essential to um, uh, their, their proper reception that uh, uh, for all that, um, uh, it, it, it is over. Um, it, uh, but again, I, I think that the um, approach of finding new, uh, emphasizing new meanings as the work evolves and finding them in the work is incredibly optimistic. Yes. Giacomo Chiari, I am a conservation scientist. By the way, I'm happy that I hear these two words in this room. <laughs> And therefore, what I'm going to say is purely technical. But it seems to me that the fact of dismantling and remounting this delicate piece of art is much more damaging than leaving it in place in, in, one single, in one place. Therefore, I would leave it in, in exhibition all the time. And then I will try to consider that as the little house and try to make it as comfortable as possible. So one thing is very likely there is photo oxidation. So we should reduce the light, eliminate with filters the wavelengths that are absorbed, that they are not seen in any way, but they damage a lot. And more than anything else, eliminate the oxygen. That will extend the life a lot. Then we all know that five degrees of temperature means doubling the life of, of, of synthetic uh, resins. So that means if you, instead of keeping it at 20, you keep it at 15 degrees, instead of 10, it's lasting 20 years. You keep it at 10, it lasts 40 years. So by making it a permanent exhibition and therefore having all the advantage of being able to see it, you also save it because you're putting in the condition on the best possible condition of being preserved. If in the worst possible conditions for the viewer, <laughs> I would Not think. necessarily, because... Well, five degrees uh, and, uh, oh, and no oxygen, I think, is I'm, I'm <laughs> pretty serious. You know. Yeah. If the, you, the viewer has to enter uh, a nice box that can be... Uh, uh, no, but you can't look at this piece through a window. That's, that's part of the terms of the work, is that it has to occupy the space, actual space, the space that you yourself are in, and um, otherwise you're, you've compromised it in a whole, in a completely different way. I knew I was speaking <laughs> as a scientist. <laughs> could, I, could I pose a question over here, Joyce Tsai? Um, I, this is a question that might appear a bit abstract, but I wonder what would happen if we start thinking in terms of how, I mean, I feel like we, we talk a lot about the life of works, and how to extend their life. But I, I wonder what would happen if we start putting the emphasis on death, being towards death, and the way in which different objects are going to kind of inhabit that being towards death in very different ways that affect 
our decisions vis-a-vis uh, -vis these objects, right? So, I mean, the, ex the uh, example of photography has been raised. I mean, Sivakram, you know, they thought that, that was the, gonna be the best new thing, but you know, it deteriorates in a certain way, so that's led to certain kinds of copies. Um, certain kinds of plastic sculptures can avail themselves to certain kinds of, you know, duplication. But what do we do with, for example, I mean, I'm working on Moholy, a set of plastic paintings you know, what do we do with those paintings where the support is actually going to deteriorate? I mean, this is, it, it's kind of an abstract question, but I feel like, I wonder how the discussion would sound um, if we start thinking about the kinds of decisions that we have to make when we start in a kind of maybe more philosophical range, start thinking about how objects are going to inevitably die their very different kinds of deaths. Does that make any sense? Okay, I, I'll yeah. just respond to that, if I may. I, I think it's my function here to be, uh, uh, as the old master painting uh, member of the panel, uh, to be uh, thrillingly old-fashioned and to look backwards. Um, but if it, uh, just responding to that point, um, th of course, at various stages in the history of conservation, people have tried to um, reverse or um, least counteract the, the, the effects of uh, history and the effects of time. And, and, and one of the great um, warning lessons in the history of conservation occurred at the end of the um, uh, 18th and beginning of the 19th century, and this was the great transfer craze of, the, um, of France and Russia, <coughs> where uh, people took against wood um, and decided that wood was such a bad thing that where paintings were painted on wood, uh, the wooden support had to be eliminated and that the paintings had to be remounted on canvas. So um, in um, Napoleon's um, Paris and in uh, 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 Russia, um, a whole, um, well, hundreds of Renaissance panels were lifted from their wooden support and put onto canvas. And um, everybody was utterly thrilled, of course, and uh, in, in, in um, th one of the art critics of the day said, you know, that, that the problems of paintings have been solved forever, and, and over the doors of uh, art galleries we can now write for eternity. Uh, and of course, those transferred paintings started to fall apart within 10 years. Um, but um, when we talk about contemporary works of art, when we talk about um, how we can perhaps eliminate uh, inherent vice in, in materials. Um, we, we must always look back and we must always see what conservatives and restorers have done before. It may not be directly relevant, but um, our hubris, our um, uh, expertise uh, must always be kept in perspective. And uh, that's a plea which I shall make again in a moment. Um, but uh, I, I think the historical perspective approaching this whole subject from uh, the past, the prehistory of our subject. It's been going on a very long time. Uh, pe uh, pe people have been uh, restoring works of art for 500 years. Um, and in fact, um, artists and conservatives have been talking to each other for much longer than uh, people have been acknowledging uh, in the last couple of days. In fact, artists used to be the restorers of their day. Um, so from the Renaissance onwards, artists were the restorers right up until the 18th century. Um, and we, we must not forget those dialogues have been with us for, for centuries. If I can just tell you my favorite artist restorer story. Um, in, Let me in just interrupt. Can we, can we can turn off the, I think we're moving in a different direction and that's just fine. So yeah, yeah but okay, thanks. And I wanted to, in, to turn this over to David anyway, so let's thank do you, that. Thank yeah. you, Jeffrey. Uh, just indulge me for one moment for a historical perspective. Um, in the 17th century, um, there was a wonderful um, trompe l'oeil painter called Van der Vaart, Dutch trompe l'oeil painter who worked in England. And he did that astonishing trompe l'oeil at Chatsworth House in Derbyshire, England, of a violin hanging on a door. And if you approach the door, you think there's a violin hanging on it with a little ribbon. And it, it, is, it is one of the most beautiful trompe l'oeils you'll ever see. And, um, and he was very celebrated and did trompe l'oeils uh, um, to order. Uh, 
And, but as he got old and his eyesight started to fail, he, uh, he turned to another profession uh, instead of trompe l'oeil painting, and that profession was picture restoration. <laughs> so there have been bad restorers uh, for, for, for as long as we can tell. But um, it seems to me that, though, that if we do approach, and then I'm opening it right up now, I'm opening it up into, into philosophy and history, it do, if we do approach what we've been talking about for the last two days from the past, what we're identifying are different discourses. And, and I've really got the sense from one or two people in the audience uh, from their questions that there's sort of bewilderment uh, that uh, the old certainties are not there anymore, um, that we're sort of adrift on a sea of relativities. And, and I think that's something that we have to address, that um, if I might paraphrase your Mr. Rumsfeld, um, uh, <laughs> that, 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 that there are um, certain uncertainties and there are uncertain uncertainties. <laughs> And, and, and I think that that's what we're dealing with here. And, and, um, and, and I really think that a lot of the old uh, certainties, uh, when we're looking at uh, objects like we have been doing here, are, are gone. And it was very interesting that Jim, this morning, read out extracts from the Code of Practice of the AIC, because all those things which we were taught as students of restoration uh, seem not to apply or seem not to apply to some of these objects. You know, the fact that reversibility, does, any, do any, does anybody believe in reversibility anymore? I don't know. Um, uh, the respect for every single remaining fragment of the original object, that sort of archeological integrity, that's what we were all taught. You had to preserve every piece of the surface and just fill in around it. That doesn't seem to apply anymore. Um, and, the whole idea of museums, um, uh, and the, the last one I was at and the present one I'm at, which is here, uh, only by uh, certainly works of art before 1900, uh, after a condition report has been written that says this work of art is a good investment. Uh, now, that doesn't apply anymore either. So um, essentially, all those old uh, certainties that um, we were taught to believe that we were trained uh, to apply uh, suddenly seem to have disappeared. And, the, and quite, perhaps quite rightly they've disappeared because we're, the sort of paradigms of, of making art have inevitably altered the paradigms of conservation. And I think that um, it'd be very interesting to know when that alternative discourse uh, Ran, started to run in parallel to the traditional discourse. It hasn't replaced it because the traditional discourse still applies in many, uh, in many cases. But that alternative discourse actually is something that some of us find uh, strange and remarkable. I would uh, like to intervene for one little detail, which is uh, about your, you know, in your summary of things. I think that with regard to this reversibility, I think there are two things that happen at the same time. On the one hand, I think, contrary to what seems to be you know, your observation, I think that in, in terms of a lot of restoration treatment of paintings, let's say, of, I, I would say Newman, for example. Newman, where a lot of Imbalda Newman paintings were uh, damaged during his lifetime, a huge amount of, I mean, basically all of them, uh, each time they were exhibited, almost, uh, he suffered, and that, and damaged by neglect or by vandalism very early on. The, the, the way Abraham became what it became is because it was van vandalized right away. Even the first time it was shown, but the second time again. And, uh, you know, so, and at that time, there was absolutely no interest whatsoever by the people who did the restoration for reversi reversibility. And it's, it's now that people are very, very uh, interested in making sure that whatever treatment they do, or even rock code, now, now we make sure that what they do is going to be reversed. So, it, and, I, and I can speak about Mondrian. All these Mondrian that were sent to the Baudry auto shop, it was not about reversing. It was you know, lined on, on zinc or covered up with whatever. It was, now people are very, I think, much more committed. So this is one thing that happened on one area. 
and, and which I, I'm not contradicting all you say, but I say uh, I think that there are two parallel stories. You know, for, for um, on the one hand, when there's nothing to be done but redo entirely, then it's you know, I think there's two t two, and I don't know exactly what the dialectical relationship is between those two. Sure, sure. And, and I think actually things go a little bit further back than you give them credit for. I mean, people have been talking about reversibility for half a century. Um, and the sort of dialogues that we're having here uh, between curators, conservators, and art historians in my area have been going on for decades. Um, so this is not new. Um, let's, let's have a slight sort of historical perspective mm -hmm. on this. Mm -hmm. Some of the problems, some of the case studies are brand new and extremely alarming and bewildering and I don't understand them, but um, uh, it, it, it's, it's but the principles behind it, I think, uh, still apply and still uh, 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 do go back further than we. I, I I'd like to jump in on David's comment because I I, I appreciate what he says, and I, we've been thinking about this a lot at SF MoMA, and I'm sure others have as well. And I think that it reminds me, Robert Irwin. Um, some of you may have heard me tell the story, but Robert Irwin came to speak and. You know, he reminded us about this whole notion of a museum as being sort of a Platonist notion of a tool, and we made it, we can change it, we can change everything under its roof. And, and in a way, that's what's happening over time, is that we live in, we live in the, you know, sort of in the presence of the works, and we're responding to them. We create these systems for understanding them. And in recent, you know, in recent history, we have a whole new set of challenges that we're confronted with. And we can actually see those challenges being addressed and the shifts that are happening within museums. And I'd love to just give you an example so that it can become concrete. Um, Pip Lawrenson, you know, spoke, spoke eloquently about time-based works. But one of the things that's happening with installations, but particularly, particularly time-based works, is that if you take the if you take the tried and true sort of conservation rule that dark storage is good for an object, it is the surest way to consign a time-based installation to death. That is never going to work. And in fact, if you flip this on its head, exhibition becomes the preferred means of preservation because you actually have to get it out there and use it. Um, there, the the kind of cycles of degradation that we have been used to with a range of other materials don't apply in this arena. And I think there's, if we thought, there's a number of ways that we're seeing these shifts happen. And I think it just builds on what David is saying is to sort of think about this as not being a situation of the sky falling, but just actually the continuum of which we're all a part. And, and if I could just add to that, of course, when, when we look at the art of the past, as, as, as I have done throughout my career, um, what, what we're seeing is, is the residue of much, much greater numbers of works of art that have been edited by time and by history. Uh, what's left in museums and in collections uh, is, is just a fraction of what was actually produced. Now, we're much closer to the um, works of art that we've been discussing in the last two days. Um, the editing process has barely started, and perhaps uh, this sort of the life and death of objects is part of the editing process that is inevitable in the production of art across the world. And we, we just have to accept that objects will disappear. It's a fairly radical thing to say in this company. <laughs> um, but, but I think provocative in the best sense um, and goes back to the question that Joyce asked uh, about reversing, perhaps, or inverting the way in which we describe the, the, the problem uh, that we're facing. Um, and I wonder how, well, say, Jim, for example, do you find in, comp in, um, in, at MoMA, in the, in the context of you know, daily life, that these questions are, um, are routine between you and your curators, um, and uh, is there, you know, is there a way in which you think that there's a, there's a um, uh, that they've been internalized now into, you know, into museum practice, or is it still something that is, um, is Well, I'm not sure what you mean by these things. You mean these questions. deciding whether we're questions. going to assign a work well, of art to the dustbin of history? Well, 
because um, sure. we're not going to do that. No, right, um, right. So the museum has its own uh, ethos of preservation, yeah. um, which will inevitably influence uh, the choices that you make. But it is a, it yeah. is a bias. Right. Uh, the, yes, it, it, it's definitely a bias. It, it's a bias that um, uh, David Nobros argued strenuously against today, um, that um, our preservation policies essentially, uh, from his point of view, and I think Jill articulated at least in the context of time-based media, uh, you know, basically um, uh, destroy the piece because it's not seen. David once said, my art will be preserved by being seen. Um, and uh, again, I find this a very optimistic way of um, uh, going about restoration that, uh, you know, eventually the thing does die, but there's a collective consciousness that keeps it alive. But that's a little more abstract than I think what you're asking, Jeffrey. Um, uh, and, and I would say that there, you know, we, no, there, there's not a lot of dialogue about whether the, the work is um, uh, uh, worth restoring or, uh, you know, w whether, it, you know, we should just forget about it. No. But there is a lot of dialogue about, um, uh, you, know, uh, you know, how we should be going about the, the restoration of any um, uh, particular work in the context, not just of that work, but the artist of, and a lot of other things. Um, I don't know if that gets... Yeah. Um, what I mean is that there's a, there may be cases in which uh, there's uh, restoration is, is is preferred versus cases in which restoration is actually compromising, um, and that's something that we've also seen over time. I think it's not a new question, but it's a question that needs to be newly applied to work to the kind of work I think that we're um, that's especially problematic in this context, which is work after 19, roughly after 1960, and I would distinguish the Mondrian case, sort of a rare one, okay, not, not so rare, but uh, a different in degree, if not kind, um, from significantly different from the kinds of problems that we face in work that, you know, post-abstract expressionist um, art, art, art making. Um, sorry. If, if I could just uh, add in there, but I mean, the, the, the very um, case histories we've seen in the last two days are part of the editing process I'm talking about. You know, certain, certain works of art have huge resources uh, spent on them. Quite rightly, I'm sure, they are um, works of art that we treasure, that we want to see preserved, that we want to see studied. But by devoting resources to those works of art, thousands of other works of art are being neglected and probably not even heard about. And so there are choices, there's triage happening out there. And um, I don't think we should be unaware of it. I think we need to keep this to the panel for, for the moment. Uh, and we'll open it up to questions in, in, in a minute. Um, I, I'm sorry, I just wanted to add one more thing to what David said. I, um, I think there's another shift based on what he just said, which is, is sort of riffing off that idea that you acquire things after they've had an examination report and the condition has been, you know, determined to be sound. And in this editing process, I think we found on a few occasions that we actually made the argument to acquire a piece for exactly the opposite reason. That it was important enough to, you know, to us in the, in the eyes of our curators that in fact, if we didn't intervene and commit the resources to this, it would be it would be lost, and and it's very interesting to see those things turned on their head, and and we have concrete examples uh, within the last few years. So, yeah, and just one more thing, um, yeah. uh, just projecting David's thoughts out further, you know, I can well imagine a thousand years from now that um, uh, people will be saying, boy, those people they were really interested in photography, weren't they? Because we put our photographs in cold storage, they're, you know, they're one material that we understand pretty well how they're going to age and how to make them last a very long time. So if we keep doing that, all the rest of the stuff falls by the wayside and there are the photographs for people to judge us by. <laughs> uh, to go, uh, it's part of the same, the same discussion, but the, this idea that um, um, everything has a life and, and, and uh, there's a kind of cycle. I think there are two. There are two issues there. One of them is, is one of restoration, and I think, even though probably from the point of view of restorers, it was something that had been discussed for a long time. At least I was not aware of the <coughs> of the way in which uh, conservatives think about the uh, speaking about res reversibility, about the fact that what they do will age differently from the original. So at some point, it would have to be redone. 
seems to be a fairly common philosophy of modern, modern conservation. I don't know how long it was originated. I didn't hear, but this, I didn't hear this discourse so, such a long, you know, for ages because I was unaware of what conservators do. I must admit, um, until let's say 10, 15 years ago. Um, but the idea that there's always choice that we make, it also goes back to what Adam Wagner was saying before. We always choose, when, when, when there's a restoration or no restoration, what you, there's always a kind of choice of what you take, what, what is, what is uh, uh, you know, remembered or picked up from, from an object. And um, the, the, this, this uh, reflection about the fact that we, we always interpret what we see, and even if we don't know it, this, the, 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 the kind of philosophical discourse about it started fairly clearly at the moment of big restoration problem in the 19th century, mm. and uh, you know, specifically in architecture. And you know, the first big essay devoted to this issue was written by a, a, a Viennese art historian, but nevertheless, that was the basis. You know, what, you know, Viola Le Duc's restoration of, of Gothic architecture is completely crazy, but he intended to do it as original. Okay, now we know it was wrong. Are we going to destroy the restoration? No, they are not genuine 19th century objects. So that's, in a way, your restorations are now genuine late 20th century or early 21st century uh, objects in some way. And, uh, you know, at, at least they will have this value. Uh, and, you know, it's, uh, it's part of the cycle. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Everything's an authentic something. <laughs> 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 okay, on that note, I'll open it up to the... Uh, <laughs> so, um, we had some questions. I saw hands going up. Um, yes. I would very briefly go back to Eva Hesse, and uh, we put a lot of thought in the artist's voice today and the artist's intention. And um, we listened very carefully to David Novaros, which was fantastic. So um, I was wondering how Eva Hesse would respond to seeing her work expanded expansion in a show today, uh, if she would like to see it this way, if she would be opposed to it, if she would probably uh, suggest to have a exhibition copy made. And that brings me also to um, the idea of uh, Richard Serra, for instance, he, the props that, are, that have been shown at MoMA recently, uh, what Lynn Cook said uh, somewhere obviously replaced because they just give way and they don't hold. Uh, do we see us in 20 years discussing about remaking the uh, Richard Serra props? We're already make, remaking with, Richard Serra props. With, uh, yeah, yeah. with gravity and with, with light and with uh, material characteristics. So is there I didn't hear anything about like what Eva Hesse's intention would be uh, about the what Eva Hesse's work would be today about this about what's left of. Jill, do you want to, well, or, do you, or do you want to turn I, it over? I, just, um, I think that is the unanswerable question. I think that's actually what makes this conversation so sort of long and um, and and studied. Um, I think we're constantly asking ourselves who are the people who who. Who are people in the absence of the artist who can translate? And I think that is a really um, difficult thing to answer. And I certainly don't know the answer, but I would turn to people, you know, who are perhaps here in the audience. I, um, I don't know. Well, I'm afraid that we develop a certain aesthetic, which is beyond the intention of the artist. But, but that's completely inevitable. Just like. That's totally inevitable. There's always, we choose. And so as beholder, we interpret. And so, you know, it's, that's like, what's, that's the way history works. And, and there, are, there are, of course, um, well-documented um, uh, 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 instances of, of both extremes that artists um, really want an object to look the way it did when they finished it. And, and other artists who are absolutely delighted with the effects of time on their work and, uh, and really rather uh, re relish it when a, a work of art has, has changed irrevocably. And I think artists are very unpredictable and uh, wonderful creatures. 
<laughs> Is there a case, David, in um, Old Master Painting of artists relishing change? Um, ch change in Old Master Paintings tended to happen rather slowly. Um, <laughs> Um, well, but then, of um, uh, is there a history of, uh, of uh, the observation of that of change absolutely. over time among collectors? And a absolutely. I mean, you know, I I if you think of um, uh, of Rubens, for example, you know, we're, sorry, we're going way back now. Um, <laughs> Ru Ru Rubens himself was a restorer, by the way. Uh, he, he he restored collections for the King of Spain. Um, but w when his works were sent uh, in closed packing cases. Um, and the, in the dark of the packing case, the, the varnish had yellowed. Uh, he, he took them out uh, of the packing cases and said, leave them in the sun for a little while and the varnish will uh, go nice and clear again. So, so there are recorded instances of, of artists commenting on the aging of their works, yeah. Um, to Jeffrey? Yes, go back to Hess, I think. Can we, is there, are there other Lynn, Jeffrey, sorry. Yes. Um, uh, in relation to Hess or, or any number of other artists, we've, I think we're in danger of collapsing the notion of intentions with wishes. And I find it hard to believe that Eva Hesse would have had intentions about commenting on the deterioration of a work far into the future. She might have had wishes about how her work existed in the future. And I think we, uh, and it, I didn't, asked David about it, but looking back on what he was saying, I think there's a distinction between some of his intentions in the 60s and some of his wishes now for how his work would be considered in the future. And I think we're much more uh, likely to pay attention to uh, intentions and very often we don't listen to the artist's wishes and one obvious case would be Agnes Martin later in her life uh, repudiated her work of the mid to late 50s, she thought it was unacceptable, and apparently whenever she could get her hands on one of these pieces that were out in the public, she would destroy them. Well, we would not allow her to get near them if we could help it, I think, most of us. So, so her wishes then were clearly a different kind of thing from any intention she might have had about the paintings. And I think that somehow we need to um, talk more about this distinction. I Agree. There's an adage, um, same person, different artist, which applies here. And, um, over time, there's a degree to which artists become very different in relation to their practice and to the ambitions of their work. And um, they apply those differences in retrospect to work that they produced before, um, which is their right, um, uh, ethically speaking. But we have an ethical, we, we also have ethical motivations that um, uh, that, that encourage us to, uh, um, uh, to recognize that works of art belong, do belong to history and the choices that were made early on, regardless of whether the artist refutes them later, remain historical choices that have another kind of value. It's got to obviously be that's the, the other key factor, which is why reference to, as Lynn was saying, intention is, um, is so dicey. Sounds like an easy solution so often, but in fact, it's a minefield. Um, um, Jeffrey, just, yes. if I could just elaborate on that. And again, on the question of self-awareness, I think we need to be aware of um, uh, when, w when we're making sort of uh, these wishful, I wouldn't say wishful, but, but we're, when we're constructing sort of ahistorical realities um, and bringing them uh, uh, to bear on uh, conservation decisions or um, deciding not to conserve things. Uh, and, and one example that I would give of that um, was, uh, again, at the Hess Roundtable, uh, I think it was Brian E. Fair said that the condition of the works uh, was, was something that she would be um, uh, loath to um, have altered because generations of students and artists uh, and the public had been influenced by them as they aged over time and that this was uh, uh, something invaluable and uh, should not uh, be lost. But I, I think that if one followed that thinking to a logical conclusion, it would lead us to a, um, a deep paralysis about uh, treating works of art. And so I, you know, uh, I, I think that that was, you know, obviously I'm very provoked by that statement and, and find it um, uh, ultimately rather problematic, but, but one that we should all be aware of when we're bringing these sorts of historical perspectives to bear on a decision about what to do about a work of art. <laughs> 
I, I don't mean to be provocative. This is a candid question, but... Um, uh, could you hold the microphone closer? <coughs> closer, all right. Um, I was wondering about um, what is the specificity of visual arts or plastic arts that um, makes that the artist is granted with so much power over his own creation. And it seems to me that this was very um, right, where we, we could run the danger of treating pieces of art more as uh, relics of a saint than as truly works of art. And I think over the course of these two days, parallels have been drawn with other forms of art, such as uh, theater or music, which seem very relevant, especially to conceptual art. But um, I, I just thought that, for example, when a piece of music or a, a play is produced, and when this is out in the open, of course the author can go back to it and rework it, but then it's another piece, and it doesn't mean that he's scraping off the first one, and the two continue to coexist. And also, I think um, it's admitted that for any other form of art, a work, a piece of art is a lot more than what the artist intended and that's what makes it art and so rich and I think that's what um, you were mentioning. So I, I wonder, I mean I imagine that this is linked to the materiality of the pieces of art but I wonder why it's so different in this particular field. If, if, if I could just sort of develop that in a slightly different direction. Uh, one thing that struck me very forcibly in, in, in these days is, is that um, the same work of art, e even if it hasn't deteriorated, um, looks so different in different display strategies and, and that actually what we're dealing with. And, and I was very struck by the, um, the, the analogy that was made yesterday between um, uh, art exhibitions and theatrical productions, that it essentially we're looking at a text, we're looking at a, a, a series of, of uh, images and texts and words and uh, um, uh, uh, cultural experiences, but arranged in, in a variety of different ways. And our experiences in all these uh, cases are, are, are very different. And um, I, I think the one thing we haven't really discussed uh, is how these works of art are actually displayed, shown, and exhibited, um, uh, and, and what a difference it makes to our consciousness of them. And I would say the degree to which something as simple as glass, as glazing, um, influences the um, way in which we um, engage painting. Um, what, go ahead. What did you, I mean, just to respond to this issue about why, the, why is materiality so much more important? Yeah. It is just that, the, let's say, with, with a poem, uh, the materiality is except if you are a, a great admirer of, let's say, layout, typography, or calligraphy, or whatever. The materiality is really more immaterial. It's in the words and in the sounds, and you know, it, it's, it's not as, it, it is affected, of course, but not, certainly not as affected uh, directly your reception, not affecting directly your reception of the book, that they actually color, um, uh, texture, uh, whatever, of a, in a painting, um, independently of what, the, what is represented. Uh, so, uh, of course, it plays a main, that's, so it leads us to be all fetishists uh, in many ways, but, you know, I'm not against uh, perversity, so, um, but it, it's like, it's a natural bent, we are, you know, bec because we admire these qualities of the, in the works of art themselves, we have to pay more attention to them than, um, than in any, especially in, piece, in, a, in with regard to art forms that involve being performed by someone else, for example. So I mean, it, it has, there's less mediation between the art and the, and the between the pro producing part and the receive, receiving part. Maybe that. Um, we need we need a microphone <coughs> back. Mm. Sorry. Hang on. The gray zones, though, also um, in terms of this materiality and what is not material, that I find interesting. I keep thinking a lot about cultural aging. Um, as opposed to material aging and points at which <clears throat> those two actually sort of seem to collapse in a lot of time-based, or I should say technology-based work. Um, I've been looking a lot recently at Günther Uecker's television objects where he basically sort of added this flood of, or flow of nails that 
kind of come down on the television. And he told me recently that those were actually running at the time in the early 60s when he was exhibiting them first. Um, which, and, and they're not running anymore, they don't work anymore. Um, so the question is, um, if these works get exhibited, um, should these be running? I, if they could be running, if we could fix them, then they would show you know, television coverage from today, which would clash completely with the materiality of this 1963 television. If we use a recording of 1963 footage, it's inauthentic, as was raised yesterday with respect to with respect to Pike. So, Uecker himself thinks of this now as a relic that is nevertheless still interesting and sort of has a new life as a different object. But mm. the cultural aging is, I think, something that hasn't been raised enough that I find interesting. I mean, I, you know, it translates into, to some degree, the aging of iconography. Even you know, think of um, lots of pop art, really. Um, Lichtenstein's typewriter eraser, you know. I mean, a lot of people probably don't even know it. Kids don't know anymore oh, what Oldenburg, that is. Oldenburg, yeah. You know? yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Anyway. Right. Yes, right. <clears throat> Back to you. Where? Oh, best. Okay, out in the back. I, I was just wondering from an economic point of view, um, what role, uh, if any, does the market value of um, works such as Eva Hesse's play in keeping these works alive or um, in saving these works? <laughs> well, this is this is the elephant in the room for anything like this. <laughs> this is this is this is a very big point and. Um, to my mind, um, you bring up an issue that in a way I feel personally like we like to keep out of the discussion because when you let it in, it um, really shapes, in a, in a very real way, it shapes a lot of decisions within institutions, I guess I would say. On the ground, it, it does influence, it plays a, a very big role. Um, I think it's easy to automatically or reflexively think that therefore it's it's um, what we're really not admitting is that it governs what we do um, which is in the, in the setting of the museum is actually um, it's it's a lot more complex than that but it's certainly an issue no question about that and an important cultural issue given what um, uh, we're hearing about cultural history and the um, the way in which the object belongs to that history um, uh, again, taking a, maybe a somewhat longer historical view on this, when, when you think of old masters, and um, particularly old masters that have been popular <coughs> since um, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the day they were working, uh, they've changed hands many times. The market has valued them, and thus they've had um, uh, you know, many different restorations. Uh, and so they wind up in collections and uh, are restored, but it may be that the um, uh, sort of secondary masters often um, are getting the attention now because those others have been um, uh, already worked on. Um, uh, it's just a sort of uh, fact of uh, a long period of time. Um. I just, I'm, I'm wondering if, given that it's the elephant in the room, um, that doesn't suggest that um, all the barriers that make it impossible to admit it to the room and that make um, art history studied so often, you know, in isolation from that. So that all the effort that goes into shutting it out, one of the things one might learn from this experience is that one of the next ones, when you do it, Jeffrey, or somebody else, um, ought to make it perhaps more front and center, because I, I got the impression, at least from what Eisbrand had said and what so many people have said here, that the politics, the power structures, um, we mentioned copyright, the legal, which I don't think is you know, something that was brought really to bear or answered um, or addressed, I guess, today. I, I think there are many issues that are kind of pushed to the side, not that the ones that were addressed were not important. I, I don't, you know, I'm not trying to say that, but I do think that these structuring, 
uh, aspects of our culture um, structure a great deal that needs to be brought into the discussion and um, needs to be acknowledged as the taboos that st structure what we do do so that we can kind of look at that again as another kind of artifact from another direction. So I thought, for example, when Dana Cranmer said, well, what about all of this that's not happening in a museum? That seemed to be huge. Um, anyway, so those kind of like whispers about what, I don't mean whispers, but commentaries that, that couldn't come into focus given the focus that this had, you know, I, I think would be fascinating as parts of what we're all trying to envision as what's the next step after what we're doing here. If, if I could just sort of make the observation that uh, market value is not entirely uncorrelated to the purer values that, you know, we find in works of art. And so, you know, um, yes, there may be a correlation between the market value of something that you choose to restore, but you may be restoring it for other reasons. Sorry, but I, I, I do think that we need to think about what we can't talk about as much as obviously what we are able to address and try to find ways to include that because I think that those can change the nature of what we understand so that the next time the conversation happens, it might include some other things or go in a different direction. You know, Nancy, there's one thought I have, and it's, a, it's this idea that we can't talk about them. I actually think we can, and particularly in a forum like this, but it has a way of truly eclipsing the conversation, and you might not get at the issues that we've spent two days talking about. Um, so to illustrate it in another arena, I think all of us are trying to figure out how to use the web to, to bring images to you know, to the public, images, movies, whatever we can. And we're all struggling with rights issues on those, on those images. And I haven't been in one of those discussions um, ever where, you haven't, where people haven't said, okay, let's just for a minute take the intellectual property issues off the table so that we can, can envision a technology that will do it. Then we'll put intellectual property back in. You can't even sort of see the possibilities sometimes because of, of these factors. So I really agree about knowing about it, being aware about it. But I think there's a distinction between um, not being able to talk about it and finding certain, uh, or making certain discussions a place where you can actually sort of privilege another line of thinking, so. We have time for one more? Sure. One more question. Hi. Uh, yes, um, go. Rebecca. <laughs> That's okay. Rebecca Helen from uh, Tate Gallery. Can oh. I ask the panel, um, where, where are you? Sorry. Here. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, can I ask the panel in, in which ways their various institutions are fostering the discussion be between curators and conservators if there are established meetings? We, we've seen a lot of case studies, which is one way um, that academics and art historians and conservators come together. Uh, are any of the institutions um, using other methods to, to bring people together? And obviously this conference is a a great way of doing that, but what happens regularly, week to week, month to month, um, in, in your institutions um, for these discussions to, to occur? I think it actually has to start, or a large part has to take place in the training context. Um, and when Ivan was mentioning teaching the class with Carol, I taught a seminar together with a conservator when I was still at Yale, um, sort of in the same direction, and I think it's something that we need to, as art historians, training art historians, curators, um, we need to just build it much more into our training. Um, and it means also a collaboration between university academic contexts and museums to make those types of classes possible. Which is why, why one of the reasons that we, we, museums that are in universities have a leading role to play in that, in that you know, teaching museums in some ways. Have uh, played a, a Play, continue to play a leading role in that. You know, start this way. I think. I mean, uh, when when Carol and I started looking, going to look at uh, Newman paintings all over uh, America, and, and 
and around the world, we went to a lot of museums who had, who had uh, a human painting, or one or two or three, and brought it, uh, asked it to be brought to the conservation lab or the museum if there was such a thing. And very often the, curate, the conservators told us that they were, I was the first art historian they had seen. Even curators didn't go to the conservation lab. And they were like, there was like two different worlds. And not, I'm not speaking about two centuries ago, I'm speaking about seven, eight years ago. Uh, I, don't, I frankly think that that situation has changed uh, for the better. And, but it all, it, you know, everyone contributes. I, I mean, Jim has been, at MoMA, has been endlessly inviting scholars to come and, and to come and, you know, look at what he was doing at the, when he was doing important restoration. I mean, you know, things, I think every, every institution probably does a little bit. And, and in the end, the climate is changing, I think, fairly rapidly. That's a great last word. <clears throat> Are you here to hook us off? I am. It is a great last word. Thank you. On behalf of all of the organizers behind the object in transition, I would like to thank everyone at the Getty who contributed to this conference. I'd like to thank all of our participants for their engaging conversations, and especially everyone in the audience who traveled far and wide to be with us these past few days. At the Getty, we're committed to organizing more events in the future that bring art historians, conservators, and curators together in conversations like this one. But as for the present, it's been truly gratifying to see the level of interest with which this conference has been met. Thank you for making the object and transition a success. <laughs>